Aloha, I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Last week on Long Story Short, we sat down with a man who says, I'm just Harry. He's the mayor of Hawaii Island, Harry Kim, who grew up in poverty just outside Hilo, the youngest child of Korean immigrants. He shared his deep admiration for his mother's courage, his father's gentleness, and he spoke of his respect for nature. This week, we'll continue to talk story in part two of a two-part conversation with Harry Kim. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. For 24 years, Harry Kim worked in Hawaii County's civil defense system, protecting people and property spread over 4,000 square miles. That's more than all the other main Hawaiian islands put together. He retired as director after getting citizens through many powerful visits from the forces of nature. You know, we, we, we think we control our destiny, so to speak. When you look back, uh, he probably had a 1% influence over it. Uh, we had a mayor by the name of Herbert Matayoshi. I was the director of law enforcement agency at the time. And uh, I used to get different kind of assignments. On that day in 1975, we had a major earthquake of 7.2. And it caused a lot of destruction, obviously. Unfortunately, a, a fatality from a tsunami. And uh, county government got criticized for lack of proper response. And a person in charge uh, told a mayor shortly thereafter that he would not like to keep the job. He was temporary anyway. And the mayor called me in and said that I want you to fix this agency. Just ensure me that when I leave this job as mayor, nobody else's death is on my conscience. And that's uh, thrown to the job. I thought I didn't want the job. I thought maybe two years and I'd leave. I wanted to go teach at the college level. And that's how much of a slow learner I am. You know, two years stayed to 24. It was just one of those things that so many things happened thereafter in regards to storms, in regards to fires, in regards to droughts, in regards to volcanic eruptions, you know, and just, uh, just kept going. And before you know it, 24 years passed. After falling into the job and enjoying that long career at County Civil Defense, Harry Kim entered the race for Big Island Mayor. That was just two weeks before the primary election in 2000, and his bumper stickers read, applicant for mayor. Kim won the election and took the general election with 50% of the votes, nearly twice that of his closest rival. He became the first mayor of Korean descent in the United States. Now, Harry Kim is nearing the end of his second term. Yeah, I'm sure everybody remembers your remarkable candidacy for Big Island Mayor, uh, the $10 limit on campaign contributions, no campaign network to speak of. Um, and I'm wondering what it was like when you, when you entered the mayor's office. I mean, clearly you knew county government. What made you think, I can, I can do this, I can do this mayor's job, and of this very diverse island facing so many challenges? I worked for county government at that time, 30 years. Every job in county government was of administrative level, just the way it turned out. The job before civil defense was the director of the law enforcement system administration of working with state, county, and federal and private sector. Civil defense basically the same, but in a concentrated field. I knew where we were financially from cabinet meetings and projections of growth and shortage of revenues. I was typical of a lot of people of seeing things not being done, but you know, you don't say anything, that's not your role. Saying things didn't matter anyway. I went in it totally aware of what the problems I wanted to address. That was one side. The other side of it was simply, I think I represented a lot of people that felt of a, a growing detachment from our government, of even distrust of that this government, which was supposed to be uh, for us, was not for us. So you went with that kind of philosophical thing, but you also knew to do what you wanted to do, you had to run a certain way. And uh, to give you that kind of independence and tell people, you know, no more than that, 
uh, no fancy speeches or brochures of I'm going to do this, I'm going to cure the you know, ills of the island and the state or whatever. All I said was one thing, I will apply for this job and I promise you to do my best to do what is right by law. And that's all I promised, yeah, no more than that. And I knew I could do it in regards to two reasons. I really felt I knew government. I really felt that I knew what the problems were. And I really felt that my jobs of past gave me the needed experience of having people work together to address it. I didn't have no magic answers you know, in regards to how to solve the problem. I just knew that confidence within because of job experience that I could, I knew these people. I could try to get them together to address the problem. And you've spent a lot of time working to get people together, and not not uh, management by fiat, but hey, let's get a group together and let's really talk about this and let's come together. And that's the job, you know. The, the hardest part of the the job is this, without any question or that answer to that, is no matter what you do with some, they don't trust you. They, they question you know, your truth and uh, I don't care what you do. And, you know, when you know 100% of what you did is of truth, of openness, and they still question you. It's, that is hard. And you haven't had any um, scandal or, I mean, that's one of the things that's uh, said throughout all, I think, um, segments of the island, that basically you've, you've dealt with truth and sincerity and good intentions and some things haven't worked out to some people's satisfaction but not because of any ill effect or mismanagement by you it's just a different vision I think we all look for people that we can trust you know, all look for people that you know will be of truth and uh, you work hard. we worked hard to be that uh, I'm so lucky that I got I surrounded myself with good, smart, you know, uh, maybe the words are wrong, but I call them pure people of what they want to do. And every day I think they, they convey that. And because they, they were told from day one that's all what we got to try to do. And the only way you're going to have people trust you is to be 100% all the time. You, you mislay them one time and all your 99 times is for naught. And I don't think I'm any different than anybody else of what I want for my leader. And I'm going to really try to be that. So let's talk about the different figure you cut in office. Um, you, you're a hard guy for lobbies to get to because you don't have <laughs> lunch. You don't play golf. Yeah, I know. Uh, but isn't that great? <laughs> no, no. You know, on lobbyists, uh, I was asked many years ago, what's my attitude on developers? And, you know, and I've always said, uh, and they're my only hope. They're my greatest hope. And they have been and they are in regards to addressing problems. I just came back from the legislature prior to this, asking for them to help us fund a transitional home and telling them how about the private sector the land is from the private sector. The people who's going to run for us are private nonprofit. People who are of community are going to help us develop it. And I think that, and I know this is going to be misinterpreted, but I'll say it. it was us in power and us in politicians that created the atmosphere that you've got to do this and butter this hand, you know, before this hand reacts. Uh, I know that's not true of most, but the atmosphere was created that way, you know, by us politicians. And so they learned they have to do that. But we created that situation. If all of us created a situation where now, they wouldn't do it. They're not fools. They're not going to do something that's going to hurt them. They're doing things that they feel they need to do. And I think because of what transpired in the past seven years of, you know, all we're interested in is the issue. I think they welcomed it more than anybody else. You know, I, I joked with them, I said, you know, any money you had to spend on me, just give it to charity on this island. And I wish they would do that, and they probably did, and a lot of people have. And I'll mention Kathleen Cook, 
McMansion, uh, Stanford Carr, you know. Uh, I just stole a legislature say Stanford Carr, you know, uh, built for me brand new a uh, safe place in Kona. And I paid for everything. And, and uh, that was his contribution on his own. We didn't ask for it, you know, he, he donated it. I know you don't mind getting your hands dirty when it comes to work, but did you ever felt like your hands were starting to get dirty in politics? Never did. Nobody ever tried to grease your palms or um, line your, your pockets? I, I think during the election there were you know, offers for financial help that you just laid a you know, tempo there, what we all will not be. And from day one, I think, uh, it, it, it didn't take long before everyone knew to just uh, address the issue. It's just not going to work to do it yeah, that way. Yeah. And it's been really good. You know, like I said, I've never had, you know there's a lot of disagreements, obviously, but uh, as long as we stick to issue and, and they stick to issue, it's, it's been good. Have you had any disappointments? I'm, I'm thinking of that five-year land dispute over Hokulia, the, um, the housing, gentleman's housing subdivision. Any, um, any disappointments during your term in office? Oh, yeah, you know. A lot of disappointment is going trying to get certain things done because you, you find out all the hoops that must go through. Uh, everybody knows about EIS, for example. You know, I mean, the average EIS takes a year. You know, and there are rules that apply to government as well as any private developer to build a highway, a major highway. You find out the average is eight to nine to ten years and the average person cannot obviously understand that why does it take so long and it does take long the hokulia issue that you brought up you know you get tied up in court and this and that but if you step back from it you know why and you can you can understand it you, you understand it you accept it you don't have to like it you know you can accept it the, the problem is trying to convey that to public or why it's taking this long and try to curtail any kind of hostility towards anybody and I still continue to try to get there but the, that kind of disappointment always there uh, there's a lot of other kind of disappointment in us in government not, not addressing or focusing on certain kind of problems and more fixated on things like roads and parks and those things Harry Kim serves a big island where there are big differences in what citizens want to see happen. But he says the differences tend to be misunderstood or overblown. And you've served so many different constituencies and of course many people still believe Hawaii Island should be Hilo and Kona side because those effectively act like two islands sometimes. Kona and Hilo side is the conflict is exaggerated, grossly exaggerated, in regards to the the, the uh, differences, so to speak. It's very understandable. Uh, if you are not of history of Hawaii, you know, Kona bloomed and blossomed and boomed, whatever word you want to use, in the past 10, 15 years at the most. Right? If 15 years ago I said to anybody in Kona, a little more than 15 years, that someday you're going to have a Walmart, Costco, Home Depot, Lowe's, traffic problems, I guarantee you every one of them would have asked me, what have you been drinking, Harry? And uh, the, the growth factor, uh, people don't even know that Queen Kalmana Highway was not finished until 1973 or 74 or so. Uh, Governor Roshi, uh coined it, I think, uh, the Gold Coast. So, because Kona was just a small, you know, quiet place. And all of a sudden this growth came, like the world, and the world did discover this beautiful place of Kona and Kohala. Naturally, the infrastructures uh, did not keep up. Naturally, there's impatience. And naturally, when you see the amount of money they contribute to the whole property tax of 65, 70%, and they see the, what they have versus what they see, perceive Hilo to have, they're gonna say, look, uh, it's not fair. So you, if you understand that, your job is twofold, to try to catch up as best as you can, but being fair to the whole island based on need, not how much you contribute. But the other part is to try to make people understand. And I really believe most of them do. 
and I believe like most things of controversy, uh, there are few that uh, will make a lot of noise, but I, can, I really believe there are few. I can feel that when I go to Kona. I have never had anyone mistreat me in any kind of tone. I don't care where I go. And the controversy of East and West or Hilo Kona, uh, I don't think is what it, people think it is. There was about a year, maybe longer, maybe shorter period where people were asking me if I was going to run for governor. I don't think I ever really seriously uh, considered wanting to run. My ego was, I think, getting to me because people were saying, you know, we want you to run for governor and do what you're doing of, of government. And it came to the point where I thought that if that was something that uh, I should do, or, you know, be responsible for, as they say. And then, you know, time came when I, I knew I had to make a decision, and so as now I would feel, you know, like I'm betraying a commitment I made on the whole island. But you were interested. Interested? Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if I can use the word interested last because... Uh, you didn't dismiss it out of hand. No, because it was about the job, about doing the job. I didn't want to be mayor. I, I know... Deal. I really didn't want to be mayor. I had my life set out. I was gonna. I did retire now, and uh, even running for second term. And this is a total truth. I didn't want to run second term, much less run for governor. I wanted to do certain things, are personal, and maybe learn to play, enjoy the fish a little more, and the birds a little more, and the sun and the ocean. Uh, my wife did not, I committed to everyone, I will tell you what my decision is by Monday, a certain Monday, because I promised this reporter, you know, I, just to put him off three, four weeks early, I said, I'll, I said this date, I just picked the date. He didn't forget. <laughs> so as the date approaches, Harry, I said, okay, you know, I made a commitment. I did not know the four o'clock that morning. No one knew. My wife, staff, cabinet, nobody knew. I had a cabinet meeting set up for eight o'clock that morning to tell them what I'm going to do because their jobs depended on it. And it was at four o'clock in the morning, sitting by myself in the dark, in the quiet, that you know, I, I felt I knew what I was going to do. That shows the political ambition, I, ambitions I had, which was non-existent. Mm -hmm. yeah. As far as governor's race. You go through all the things uh, you would like to see the government focus on that I don't think we are. There are certain social issues that I really wanted to see if could be done. But decided your obligation was to the Hawaii Island. Uh, I, I tell you what my thought process went that morning. Regardless if I ran for governor, regardless if I won, regardless if I lost, I would have a real difficult time looking at Hawaii's people in the eye again because I would feel like I betrayed them. Because when you run for office, it's automatically without saying anything. You're committing yourself for four years. Nowhere did I ever say, maybe two. And I, it was an understanding I was going to be here for four years and I felt that if I, I left, I'd be leaving in two. And that's a betrayal. From a sense of loyalty he felt he owed the people who elected him to office, Harry Kim chose to serve out his term rather than resign to enter the race for governor. He's now getting ready to wrap up his second term as mayor. Harry Kim's approach to politics and governance has been called unconventional. He doesn't do lunch, he avoids the dinner event circuit, and his dress-up clothes are pretty much his everyday clothes. Everybody knows you as the guy who wears jeans hey, everywhere. Hey, I, I bought the better looking jeans today. <laughs> I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Have you ever worn dress slacks in office? Oh, uh, yeah. I think um, first day when I got inaugurated. <laughs> and uh, then? <laughs> second time when I got inaugurated second time. I think that's about it. And no need otherwise. I mean, you know, I... I I don't feel comfortable wearing certain kind of clothes. I, I, you know, obviously I have them. I'm sure people wish I wore them more, but and 
a swear one and feel comfortable. It's funny, isn't it? A lot of people who grew up without a lot, they their dream is to have the material comfort they didn't have, but that doesn't seem to be true in your case. Oh, I like comfort. I like clean water. I don't want to worry about food. One of the things that is a scar that's there for whatever reason. I like a dry place and a dry house because we have so much leakage. Walk into school every day, whether it be a couple of miles and back, not only in an umbrella and many times caught in the rain, wet and cold, you, you have that. Uh, I was talking to you earlier about everything else is a quest for peace. You know, what brings me, what makes you feel good. Nature makes me feel good because uh, I depended on nature. I love, when you're a kid with macho problems, you don't say it publicly, but I love touching and staring at flowers and beauty of flowers. I love wildlife, I, I love fish. Uh, I have pet fish that I call names in the ocean. Yeah, and they, they grace me with the uh, letting me touch them or they touch me. Uh, I have a high impatience of people that have very low tolerance of people. Uh, I, I have a strong, strong uh, dislike of people, of violence. And yeah, that's what stuck with me. Uh, I'll always know the hardship of my mom and dad, of their loss of family because of war, of men, you know, said. I've said it many times less. I consider man's greatest failure is that of war. And I will always uh, feel that. To me, I'm not talking about wars of country, I'm talking about any individuals. Uh, when you have, when you resort to say, I don't like you, so I got to kill you. you know, what else can you say about that? It's got to be our greatest failure. You know, that, that's the only way we can resolve something. And I think that all reflects of why we're trying to do the things the way we, we are doing and why I, I love our cosmopolitan past. Uh, I think the Hawaiian people is our greatest gift to have natural warmth and beauty about them and uh, that's innate with them. And all of those things of which I grew up that uh, are special. The problems will always be there. The only difference is how do we resolve them? And that's what I just want to dedicate the rest of my time for, you know, in regards to a better way to resolve problems. It doesn't mean that people are going to be happy in the end result, because I learned something a long time ago. If you have a problem, I don't care how many people are on each side, and the two sides, you can get them together. But on one side come together with a total confidence, are uh, we going to get everything we want? You have nothing. Yeah. Uh, you have to come to the table with an idea that you're going to listen. And that's our biggest task, just to talk to them. Will you at least come and listen? Yeah. Not to give your side. Will you just come to listen to the other side and then talk? It takes and, a lot of time on your part, doesn't uh, it? Yeah. it? But you know what the fate of mankind, you find that most of the people, they want that too. I really believe they want that too. So uh, when you leave office, are, you've, you've said a couple of tantalizing things that maybe you'll go back to teaching or maybe you'll devote your life to peace and resolution of war? I would like to do that. I don't care how small a scale. and I, I'm not you know, putting myself on any pedestal level. Okay? I can be on any level. And what greater way to spend your life than that? And I, uh, I want to see what else I can do. This job ends in less than 10 months. And uh, I'll see what else I'll do after that. Does that mean you're not going to take up golf? Or you're not going to learn new hobbies or any hobbies? You know, once uh, we went on a vacation, and you asked the uh, what do kids want to do? Everybody named one thing. And I told them what I wanted to do, and I'm going to show you how limited my, how easy it is to make me happy. 
and the family knows this. I said, I just want to find me a beautiful stream in Oregon. That's where we're going to go. I'm going to take off my shoes and I'll wade knee deep, stand there and feel the freshness and coolness of the water, listen to the water, listen to a look at the beautiful trees, and that's all I want to do. You're a, you're a cheap date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, but really, you know, uh, you give me a choice of what I want to do, and I, I love that. I just love that. We can only speculate about what retirement will mean for Harry Kim. He has no hobbies, and he doesn't enjoy traveling. Will he make a run for governor in 2010? He says he has no yearning to be governor. That's not exactly a definitive answer. As you recall, he also said he didn't need to be mayor, and he didn't seek out his civil defense job. I'm glad you could join me for another long story short. Mahalo to you and Harry Kim. Please log on to pbshawaii.org each week to see who's coming up with their stories. Keep sending us questions and suggestions by email. And please tune in next week for another Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition. It's in Sony's DNA. Every single day I touch a flower. Every single day. Uh, I need it. I don't do it because of any other reason that I need it. The staff knows that they catch me looking at the sky. Or, you know, it takes me sometimes 10 minutes to walk from my car to my house because uh, I stop and look at the trees and uh, listen to the birds. And, you know, I need it every day. I need my medicine and nature's my medicine. Thank you.